Hey, all you cool cats and kittens. Thanks to COVID-19, it's weird out there. Everyone looks like they're robbing a bank when they go to Walmart, and our, our grandparents have a TikTok account. It was enough to make us all say WTF and eat some cookie dough. But then Tiger King came out on Netflix, and now we all feel better about ourselves. Today, I'm talking with John Hamm, owner of Animal Tales Southeast to get an insider view on the animal part of this whole story, treatment, ethics, inspections. But this is also just kind of an open discussion, an after hours special, if you will. In fact, at the risk of being basic, I brought a White Claw and I'm gonna drink. <laughs> so uh, let's get this party started. Welcome back to the show, John. Welcome back, appreciate it. <laughs> You're my first repeat guest. How does that make you feel? Oh, awesome. That's great. First timer. Yeah, episode 13. Lucky 13. Awesome. Well, this is a great one to talk about. This is a hot topic. Everybody is talking about the Tire King. I mean, I, I did not want to watch this show. I didn't want to watch it. As soon as I saw it, I was like, all right, I already know what this is about. I'm done. Next thing you know, you got to watch it. It's not about the animals. It's about the people. Do you know the Tiger King? John, John, two o'clock in the morning, I get a call and somebody be like, come on, you know, you can tell me, you know, him. you can tell me it's okay. I'm like, in my profession, it's probably not the best. <laughs> to know like that. I was like, I don't know him. And they're like, no, you do. It's okay. We'll keep it between us. <laughs> That's hilarious. So did you binge watch it or did you like space it out? Oh, one day. Seriously? Oh yeah. As soon as I started it. Well, I do it. Well, I watch, I still have all my animals and I, I have to take care of. Yeah. So, um, every single day so i just set and prop up my phone on my little roll cart that i roll around to clean and feed everything and i just throw on a youtube video and uh i knew that show was out and i like i said avoided it and finally somebody said you gotta watch it so i was like all right i'll start it here and i was trying to work and do it at the same time and i ended up just leaning over in my cart staring at it for like a good half an hour i was like all right i'm gonna turn this off get done with my stuff and then go inside and binge it and i did yeah it's addicting and it's a lot of that whole like this is not real. This is not real. <laughs> this doesn't exist. Yeah, it's like when I was watching it, that's that was my exact response because it you just are like, these can't be real people. These look like characters from Reno 911. You remember that show? Yeah. Funny story is one of the main characters from Reno 911 just got done playing uh, Joe Exotic. Uh, he did a fake Joe Exotic interview with someone. That was pretty funny to see. Oh, I think I saw that. I've been binging on like other content on YouTube about Joe Exotic, but oh, yeah. So my first question is what the heck, how do people get big cats at all? Like how, how does one just like, like Joe, he was a regular non animal person. And then he was like, Oh, I'm going to own some big cats. How, how does that even happen? Well, yeah, it was a transitional thing. So he started out, I believe, uh, having different types of animals with his brother, something like that. And then he got into doing magic shows with somebody that did magic and to kind of entice people to do the show. He's like, hey, I got tigers. I'll bring the tigers along. And then that all transitioned to the zoo eventually. And it's and our society is changing. So in the past, it was a lot easier easier to get these animals. Nowadays, regulations are much stronger. It is a lot harder for you to acquire a tiger. And and that's all state to state, county to county, that all changes. So it, you may go to Illinois or Ohio where they had that, that big issue up there, and suddenly they won't let you have one. There's like, nah, you can't have one. There's, there's no, only big zoos and things like that can have them. Uh, so the regulations are getting better. Like you say, he's been doing this for 30 years. So 30 years ago, the regulations are so much different than they are today, even a few years ago. And so he was kind of grandfathered in. And a lot of people that have animals that are not allowed anymore might still have them uh, because they were grandfathered in because the law passed after they already owned the animal. But where are they even buying them from? So it, most of the time it's breeders. It is breeders in the United States. So it, all animals at some point came from the wild, obviously. But then they bring them to the United States and they breed them uh, and for multiple reasons. Sometimes it's for profit. Sometimes it's for education or zoos. They breed them for all different types of reasons. Uh, but it's expensive. Uh, have these animals and to be in that business where you're producing the animals, you got to find home for them. The business is to sell the animals, unfortunately. And that's where maybe the good intentions of, hey, I'm going to sell these animals to good people 
is the beginning intentions, but at the end of the day, those people will run out and you have animals to feed and you have to feed those animals. So unfortunately, they end up selling those animals to people that probably shouldn't have them. Hmm. So someone today, because the regulations have changed, like you said, could someone today purchase animals? We'll, we'll talk about the state of Florida because that's where we live. And those are probably the laws you're most familiar with as like an insider animal person. Could yeah. someone today get big cats? Like just if they had the money. If they had the money, yes. Um, in order to get a big cat in Florida, you first of all have to have USDA license. So your facility had to get checked out by USDA. So you have to build a facility first. After you built the facility, then you'd have to get it approved. You have to get a class three fish and wildlife license. And there's a whole bunch of regulations they have with, with enclosure size, with uh, security, double gates, this, 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 and this. They have to meet all those expectations, expectations through fish and wildlife and through USDA. Once they meet all those, then they could have those animals. So they couldn't just go buy a tiger right now and take it home with them. There's no, that would be illegal. They would get arrested or highly fined. Is that, so we were talking earlier off mic about like exotic animals in general, right? Because mm -hmm. obviously big cats are exotic animals, but are the regulations, are there general regulations for all quote unquote exotics that people have to follow? Yes, uh, and it's state to state. So like for us, uh, I could technically have a fox here, but it's illegal for me to take it to Alabama. In Alabama, they made foxes uh, illegal because they're worried about uh, rabies. And so all foxes are banned, doesn't matter what species, whether it's an issue or not an issue, they're all banned. So it's illegal for me to take a fox into that state. Same thing coming into Florida. Florida bans a lot of stuff from coming in because they have a huge import importation spot in uh, Orlando and Miami from all these international places. So Florida's actually got a really strong uh, protection of exotic animals coming into the area. But it's where the breeding happens in state and or just in the U.S. in general where those lines start to get blurred and the standards start to drop. Well, situations like this actually help it. So things like the Tiger King give more people awareness. It gets more people involved. More people are going to go out there and want to see the difference of what's going to happen uh, or what about these animals. Like more people are going to say, I want to be involved in that Tigers are not bred or tigers are not in my state. So they're going to go out there and they're going to fight and they're going to vote and they're going to make a difference. And that's, that's how it is as an animal person being in the field for 17 years. 17 years ago is so different than today. Yeah. It's just every year I'm always having to keep track of what animals are illegal in what areas. Uh, I, I have a, a fruit bat that I've had for over six years. He was born with us. And uh, he, all fruit bat species just recently got banned in the state of Florida. So I had to call and say, hey, my fruit bat is part of what you're banning is it okay for me to have it and they approve me to still have it but because it, it's really these other species that they're worried about and so that's where it's just changing every single every single year it's different animals that get that get banned in some way do when you when you describe the process where if someone wants big cats they have to build the enclosure first and then they have to have a usda and fish and wildlife inspection and pass the inspection is there any consideration for natural disasters like hurricanes within those enclosure regulations? Yes. So with Fish and Wildlife and with USDA, um, Fish and Wildlife is the bigger one on this. They require you to have a hurricane procedure where you actually have to make up, okay, if a hurricane comes, what are you going to do? And you have to have that in your protocols whenever you renew your license or set up your license. And you have to have that mounted in your facility. So when they do come check your facility, it's there for them to see, hey, here's your hurricane procedures, here's your fire procedures, and here's your emergency features, or here's your vets that, that you contact because you're required to have a vet that supports your facility. Um, you have to have all that paperwork there. Hmm. And does the vet always have to do distribute the, the medicine and – Yes, yes. Was, when you have a USDA I, license, that's what the USDA kind of is bigger on that. You have to have a, a certificate of veterinary care is what it's called. Mm -hmm. Whenever you get USDA inspected, it's required that you have that. Your vet has to come check off your facility. They sign off whenever they've seen your facility. Uh, and any medications that you give your animals, anything that happens, anything that has to do with the vet has to be recorded on that document. And then whenever the vet comes or whenever the USDA comes, 
they look at that and they go through it and say, hey, you gave this animal this or whatever and check it all out. Or if you're talking to them and you come up to an animal and say, oh, this animal is sick, they'll say, well, what'd you do about it? Mm. Did, you, did you get anything for this animal? Oh, yeah, I gave him Batril or something that out of my back cabinet. And they're like, uh, no, <laughs> you can't do that. And that's where they'll, you'll get marked for that is what they'll call it. And there's with different regulate with USDA, there's different regulations on certain things are considered higher tiers, but all of it generally comes down to a checklist of if you do a couple of things wrong, you can lose your license. It's one, two, three, but there's different things that are higher tier, like declawing or defanging, for example, it's illegal. You can't do it. If you were to declaw or defang your animal, they'll immediately take away your license. Okay, I'm so glad you brought up the declawing thing because I thought I read or saw or something that some of the animals in uh, Joe Exotic's care were declawed. They might have been, yeah, because the, up until, so now you, there was USDA West, USDA East, and uh, I don't know when they combined, but it's pretty recent that they combined. Uh, but I remember talking to my USDA officer maybe a decade ago up in Kentucky and I was talking to him about it and it's, it was illegal for declawing and defanging uh, for the East coast, but not the West coast mm. of USDA. And it was like that for a long time, but now they're all combined and it's illegal everywhere. You can't do it anywhere anymore. That's where I talk about these protocols get better and better and better and things do change over time. But yeah, whenever that came out or whenever he was filming, most likely it was not illegal yet. Not, it's not illegal. It's not allowed under a USDA license. So, so technically, like if you want to get your cat defanged or declawed, you can legally do that. Um, it's, it's just not recommended. I mean, no, no animal person wants anybody to do that. They do that for the ability to put those animals around people and make it a safer atmosphere for them or maybe a safer atmosphere for themselves any animal person's not going to agree with that. And that's where you, finally the regulation stepped up and now it's no USDA allows it. Yeah. I think a lot of just people with pets are not for that at all. And as you said, the regulations change, but also education changes where people are more aware that, Hey, this actually hurts the animal. When you're talking about the different regulations on these facilities, Something that I came across was zoo versus sanctuary. Mm -hmm. Earl Baskin has a sanctuary. Joe had a zoo. So what's the difference? They're one of the same. Typically, it says how it's run. If I'm, if I'm correct, uh, even though he called it a zoo, he was a nonprofit in some other videos I watched. He was a nonprofit facility, and she is a nonprofit facility. Uh, calling yourself different names, it's kind of up to what you want to do. But they're both, I believe, nonprofit facilities. I would double check that, but I'm pretty sure that's what they did. Now, uh, a lot of them, I think he mentioned about going from nonprofit to a profit at some point, but I don't, I can't remember. I, I barely caught up on that information. Yeah. Well, that's the crazy thing about this whole Tiger King story is it's like 10 stories within a story. And you could go down the trail of the legal stuff. You could go down the trail of the animal. And certainly the characters in this show themselves were just crazy. Like, in what world can you watch a show about tigers and lions where the tigers and lions are the backdrop to the characters of the show? Like, the characters were so big and flashy that you you kind of forgot like wait it's a sort of an animal show and you just get wrapped up in such weird details like i kept watching it and i was like how often does he have to reapply that eyeliner because he, it it's was tattooed on what it's tattooed on oh okay see you know things I, I, i'm so it's stupid it's stupid i get involved way too much addicted like in his waterline which is really hard to keep eyeliner there and anyway and then um someone else said why is no one else why are these people not wearing a shirt when they're being interviewed and i i, I watched an interview with um one of the guys and he said it was the dirt yeah yeah they was set up. yeah they told him they told him hey we need you to take your teeth out we need you to take your shirt off and that's typical tv uh there's actually uh, Somebody I used to work with, he told me about this, that uh, he was talking about Discovery Channel. And this is old, long years ago, like 20, 30 years ago. Uh, 
And he said the way, I don't know if this is true or not, it's just what I heard, so don't take me <laughs> exactly on this. He said all the time, like the way they would see these animals in the wild is they would not actually find the animals in the wild. They would take animals from the zoo and they would put them out in the wild and like with a reptile or something so he wouldn't swiggle away. They would get him a little bit more colder so he'd slow down and they'd set him out there and they'd be like, all right, go out there and find him. He'd go, oh, look, over there, it's a rattlesnake, get it. And then they'd pick up the rattlesnake and be like, look at this rattlesnake. And really, then they go put it back in the truck and then go back at home after that. So it's all set up. I don't know about all that. Like, that's, uh, yeah, I guess that's an important reminder that when we see these things, they aren't, there's real parts of it, but it isn't the real yeah. story. For example. Yeah, that's, and that's what I was trying to get at with that was that, yeah, this show does focus on some real aspects at the same time. It is a show, so you've got to watch it for that. And it does have a narrative, and it really brings you into that narrative of the show but there's always different sides. Uh, I, I watched so many YouTube videos that he posted of his, you know, he, put, he did all those videos. You can go back and watch a lot of those and see the extended versions of that. And it kind of changes some perspectives on some things. Yeah. And just remembering that, like we said at the beginning, that these are real people because they seem so bigger than life that, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I don't know about you, but when I watched it, it was a bit of a roller coaster because at first, they're talking about Joe's background and how he, almost, you know, he tried to commit suicide. And I was like, oh, my gosh, he's like, he's a hurting person. And they told Carol's story, how she was raped. And every character that uh, was portrayed in the staff of the zoo had some crazy backstory. And um, so, it, it, but then you see, like, the dark side. So then it went up and down. And so here's, you want to hear my theory? Go for it. So my theory, my, well, the question is, well, what's the re what's real, right? Is Joe an okay guy? Is Carol a uh, good hearted, but cut crazy animal person? W who are all these people? What's real? What's not real? And I think because they all came from a situation where they had to survive, they have survived by reinventing themselves. Like mm -hmm. Joe reinvented himself over and over again. He saw opportunity. Oh, internet. Oh, opportunity. Boom. Reinvented himself. Same thing for really every person in the whole Netflix series. Like half of them were just discovered on Craigslist. So they didn't come from an animal background. They were like, oh, I worked at Taco Bell and now I'm running yeah. the tiger cages. So they all adapted like animals. <laughs> so um, that's the, the truth is they're all of the things. They're the nice yeah. guy. They're the cruel guy. They're the crazy. They're the sweet. It's, it's everything. But they just are showmen and it's amplified. Yeah, there's so many versions of that. So we'll go, go to the people that got hired. It was so hard to be like, Oh yeah, well I, I saw this ad for working with cats. I'm like, that'd be cool. I'd go do that. Yeah, that's not the animal world. You don't go to a zoo and just see people are like, oh, I thought this would be cool, so I got in there. Ninety, I would say about ninety to ninety-five percent of people in the zoo are people who went out and got four-year degrees in different zoology, biology, wildlife biology, so many different things. Uh, and then on top of that, they've done internship after internship after internship. I've got somebody that, that works for me. She's done nothing around four internships already. Mm -hmm. um, and she wants to get into a zoo. She's about to graduate soon. And so they just, they have all this experience they accumulate and then they go to the zoo and the, and the zoos, the bigger the zoos, like I said, the AZA zoos, there's top of the line. They're doing all the, the best stuff out there. I definitely want to circle back to the AZA subject in a minute, but before I forget, I want to talk about celebrities and movies. Um, I watched Hit the Hangover <laughs> last night or the night before. I uh, forgot there was a tiger in the bathroom, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is so weird because, you know, I knew I was going to talk to you, and we had been watching Tiger King. So, of course, I get on Google, where is the tiger from in Hangover? It's one of Mike Tyson's seven tigers. One of his real tigers, yeah. Yeah. yeah I don't know if he still has the tigers anymore. I think they're gone now. Well, Pretty yeah. Sure. And the movie was old. So, so the, these are my two questions. Is One is, do you think that, that the trend of famous people, rich, rich celebrity people having 
tigers is going down? And two, how can we as just regular people like support? What do we do about the movie thing where, you know, can everyone just use CGI or is there any um, industry regulations around the entertainment industry and as it ever, for, you know, has to do with animals? I'm not in, in that industry at all, but I watch, I obviously as an animal person, I catch all talks about animal stuff. So it, it it's highly regulated. Like I listen to, um, gosh, there's so many actors I've listened to talk and they'll talk about the animals and how the trainer will be there with the animal and how the animal has to have its break time. I'm in PETA is there watching to make sure that yep. everything's going on okay. And sometimes PETA's on set or they have a part of like, you have to send it off to this. I, I, don't, I don't know who, I'm not in that industry at all, but I, I'm pretty sure there's like a USDA of the film industry that basically oversees animal health and make sure these animals are not being abused in any way. They are well-trained. They're not being overworked by any means. They're, they're pampered big time. So uh, the, the forward, ones you see are on the film nowadays. Yeah. So as moviegoers, we don't need to like freak out and boycott movies with animals in them necessarily. No, no. They, they, and that's the thing is a lot of them go to CGI because it's so much of a pain to actually use animals because of all the regulations and hoops they got to jump through to have an animal on set. That makes sense. So you said you had some specific um, viewpoints of animals in captivity from both personally being a live animal presenter but you've got lots of contacts, zookeepers, USDA, Fish and Wildlife, lots of people in this field. So kind of give us the scoop on the opinions of animals in the captivity from the different viewpoints that you personally have heard. Yeah, that was the main reason I called you. I was like, man, there's so much I want to talk about with this. And I don't want to do it on my personal, on my animal tail stuff, because that's not what we do. We focus on animal education, mainly for kids. And this is an adult program where I wanted to talk to adults about this subject, because there's so many viewpoints. And obviously, I wanted to hear that of, of my peers and all my people, my zookeeper friends and the USDA and everybody I could possibly talk to. Like, what's your thoughts on What's your thoughts on it? Just get this collaboration of knowledge. And it is all over the place of what people think about uh, this, this show and um, and how they think about animals. So it's, I guess we could start with uh, tigers in general in captivity. So everybody heard the fact that the, there's more tigers in the U.S. than there are in the wild, and that's true. Uh, should we keep doing that? Should we keep breeding these tigers so that way we have them in captivity? Now, mo I, I don't think any tigers in captivity that are born here are going to the wild over there. I'm almost positive none of them are, and the reason why is genetics and stuff. You would put them out there, cause issues. These were all born through generation and generation in captivity, so to put them back in the wild, it just wouldn't work. That's how it is with most species. So what's the point in breeding? The point in breeding them is to get people to see them in person and get them inspired to care about them in the wild to protect them as much as possible. I was just told today, I haven't verified this, but I was told today by a friend of mine, she double-checked the uh, the doc Antle, who is her least favorite person, doesn't like him at all, but he's sending so much money uh, overseas to for conservation, for conservation of tigers, different uh, going against poachers, going against all this different stuff that I have to, I just got about an hour ago, and so I haven't got to research any of it, but there's lots of different things that he's doing and money that he's put forward. And she brought up a good point. And her, the point she brought up was Steve Irwin. Everybody knows Steve Irwin. You remember Steve Irwin? Uh, of and, course. Yeah. Everybody loved him. I loved him. He was one of my idols. He's the reason I've probably gotten to what I'm doing today is because of Steve Irwin. Yeah. But if you took his method and you went to a zoo and said, I want to be just like Steve Irwin, most zoos would want to hire you because that is not how they work with animals in captivity, the way he manipulated them. The thing is, what he did helped conservation in another way, because he brought people in, he got people inspired, uh, cared about the animals, and he sent so much money back into wildlife conservation, just making video after video after video, and then spreading it, and he's probably one of the biggest con contributors out there, even though he didn't do things that were considered right. So it goes back to where does the money go? Like, Where's the money go that you're making and, and keeping with that message? And that's something with Joe Exotic that he lost when he was younger. At the very end of the uh, Netflix thing, it shows a picture of him young with Tiger. And he's like, these animals do not need to be in the wild. We do not need to breed these animals. And as he gets older, he loses that 
that thought process because the bills and reality start setting in of, hey, hey, I got to feed these animals. I got to make money. All right, hey, oh, you're going to give me $50 to touch them? Okay, well, uh, maybe I'll do a couple more times. I'll do a couple more times. And he gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually now he's sitting here where he's relying on that money to supply all, all these animals he decided to take in because he was a rescue. He did take in everything. He took in all different types of animals. And so it's not cheap. Animals are not cheap, especially those type of animals. He and they talk about the money stuff. They talk about the expense of it. And it's insane. It's so much money, and you got to make money somewhere. And I don't, I don't agree with it, but uh, with what he did, um, I'm not. I don't do petting stuff. I've never pet a tiger before. I haven't worked in a tiger petting facility. All I've heard from from other people is that there are some that are well regulated, where it's a time thing. And let's jump into petting of tigers. Should you pet a tiger? Should you not pet a tiger? The best way I've heard it uh, regulated is that in zoos, the animal has the option to be touched in a petting zoo situation. Almost every zoo has some sort of petting zoo. That includes sheep. It will include goats. And they put you into the area, and the sheep or goats either come up to you and let you pet them, or they don't. The animal has the choice to be pet or not pet. They're not forced, not handed out, say, here, pet this animal. Because I've heard a lot of uh, health experts talk about the effect, the effects it has on the tiger where they get touched too much and it makes them stressed, especially at a young age. They can pick up different diseases and stuff at a young age. So there are a lot of things that could happen to that tiger at a young age that they could get sick. But on the other end, I've heard uh, health people talk about, well, the timing thing, as long as they don't do it too much, the, the tigers are only allowed to see a certain amount of people a day, like there's a cutoff of how many people they can see. So it's, it's on either side of where you got some that are no touch at all, and some are like little moderate touching. Obviously, nobody's okay with this unlimited touching. And it's hard for a consumer to know in a moment's notice, where is this organization sending their money? Mm-hmm. What are the regulations around how this animal is being treated? When was their last inspection? Thankfully, like you said, with the internet, we can access a lot more information. But I remember as an eighth grader, I was in a mall in Bellevue, Nebraska. I'm pretty sure it was Bellevue. It was either Bellevue or Omaha. And I had just finished like a, a choir performance and my brother and my mom, we were going through the mall. I don't know why, but there was like, hey, come feed, bottle feed a baby tiger. And of course, like I love animals. So I was like, yeah, oh my gosh, this is amazing. So somewhere I have this photo of me and my brother sitting and the tiger's on our lap and I'm holding the bottle. And, you know, it's like moments like that. In fact, we have a question from a listener. Let me grab that real quick. Uh, Stacy, you know Stacy Kosovicki? Yeah. So she said, did all of us visiting baby animals over the years accidentally contribute to a black market, animal cruelty, et cetera? And if not, how can you tell who to support? Uh, this is where it gets difficult about whether touching is okay or not. Because of that, you two have a passion for animals. I mean, you never know how much that that affects somebody when they see that animal at a young age and now they care about those animals the rest of their lives. A lot of animal stories I hear is at a young age, at some point, they saw this animal, they saw that animal, and now they spend the rest of their life caring about those animals. So that's where it's like, should we have tigers in captivity? If you don't have them, you don't think about it and something happened to them. Let's jump to amphibians real quick. The highest decline in the animal world right now is amphibians. There's a virus called the chitrid virus. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. But either way, it's just demolishing animals in South America. Nobody really knows about it or cares about it or puts too much effort towards it because they're frogs. They're not mammals. We're not associated with them. But if you were to see more frogs or you go to, there's a zoo I used to work at that does exhibits just with those frogs. And it talks about that. And then somebody comes through and sees that. And wakes them up and says, oh, well, I want to contribute to this. I want to give money to this. And that's where the exhibition of animals where they can see them changes things. Your visual perspective can change how you think about that animal. And that's where, did it hurt? Did it help? Uh, I think what helps is regulations. Uh, make things harder for people. Make, make sure there's really good regulations on those animals that they are not being uh, hindered in any way by being shown or being touched or being uh, photographed or anything like that. So 
to kind of go back to the different perspectives of the different people, I, I realized I kind of took a rabbit trail. I may have cut you off short. Yeah, there's so much to get to. <laughs> All story, like, hold on, hold my beer. We got a lot to do here. Um, yeah. So zookeeper, USDA, fish and wildlife, animal, animal presenter, um, talk, and so we were, we were talking about petting zoos. And the, yeah. the animals have the option to kind of walk away. So, yeah, so continue on that path, if you will, of the perspectives of the different subcategories of the animal industry. And there are things on um, animals in captivity. So as far as, as far as what with the petting zoos? Oh, the petting zoos in general, they're going in a big decline. And the reason they're going in a big decline is because we get more educated about it. We get more educated about their situation of those animals sometimes are not the best. Maybe they've been overstimulated. That is regulated by USDA to do check out, hey, do you have a time frame on this? Do you have a limit on animals that you bring in there? Uh, salmonella is a big issue. Um, goats and sheep, or sheep in general can carry salmonella. So that's why there's always hand sanitizer there. If you get hand sanitizer after you touch, is to, to limit that. Uh, so it, it's a health concern, and as that's getting higher and higher, it's getting more and more difficult for these petting zoos to exist because of all the regulations that are being put down on them. Hmm. So one of the regulations was this AZA accreditation. So talk to me about the process of a zoo or a sanctuary getting AZA. Uh, AZA is tough, and it's tough for a number of reasons because Unlike USDA, USDA is run by the government. They have kind of minimal guidelines of like, you have to have this minimally or you can't do it. And they, they establish that those animals are being taken care of uh, to make sure they, have all, they meet all these minimal guidelines. With AZA, it's another step up. Uh, AZA is by the peer. So it's like, and biggest critic for animal people is other animal people. So if I bring you into my facility and you look around like, oh, this looks cool, this looks great. And then I bring some animal person into the facility, they might be like, Oh, that over there, or that over there, or that over there. We're, animal people are the, the, the critics. So with AZA, they usually elect a board from directors and curators from a bunch of different zoos. They bring them into your facility and walk around with them and say, hey, that ceiling's missing. That happened when I was at the Birmingham Zoo. Uh, in our uh, back area, there was uh, open in the top, and you could get up to the roof there. And they're like, that could be escape for an animal. You need to put up a ceiling. And so they had to put in $10,000, $14,000 ceiling to secure that. And it's like that throughout the zoo. They go through and make these different comments and you have a time frame to get all that done. If you don't get it, you won't get your accreditation. Now that's just part of it. The, with AZA accreditation, it costs a lot of money. So not, not like any facility can have it. It's very expensive. And there's all these other guidelines you have to do with outreach and conservation. You have to do conservation. Uh, Special Species Act, there's a whole bunch of stuff. And I, I, I haven't been involved in it in a while because uh, it's usually reserved for big zoos, so it's probably even more stringent now than it ever was. So aside from AZA and having to do conservation efforts, there's really no tiers of um, inspection or accreditation. It's like your USDA, which is very minimal, or your AZA, which is incredibly hard, and there's nothing in between. Now, don't take my don't take my USDA wrong. USDA doesn't mess around. I mean, they are very picky. They'll write you up for a cut cutting board that has too many cuts on it. Like oh. even if it's clean, it'd be perfectly clean. That happened. That I learned about it. I mean, <laughs> going through USDA inspection for a while, we had this white cutting board, and it was spotless. We'd clean it every single day. There was no food, no traces of anything, but it had a lot of cut marks on it. And so, because it had a lot of cut marks, we got written up for it. So. When I say minimal guidelines, don't take that wrong okay. way. Like it's like, oh, this place is complete crumb. They're just barely meeting. They, they're still tough. Like I've, I, another thing, this, I haven't been written up for anything luck, at five years now uh, of being in the South, but, but you learn things. You go through processes. One time the fridge was a little dirty. We had too much dirt on that. Not the, the inside of the fridge was dirty. It was just the outside. It, it had little dust on the side from changing shavings and stuff, and it wasn't wiped down. And so... Written up, for, written up for that. Those are the small things that I was talking about. Those bigger things like declawing, they just pull your, pull your license right away if you do anything like that. And there's lots of versions of that stuff. And the bigger facilities have more, um, more impact on me, especially people who sell animals. Uh, I know some facilities that, that sell animal breed and sell, and they, they have to see USDA multiple times a year. Um, 
And when they do, it is a process. Uh, I watched Joe Exotics uh, USDA inspection, and it's about seven to eight hours of that person is going through and critiquing and checking everything about your facility and saying, hey, that, that, that gate's not tall enough over there. You need to add that or else we can't keep, you can't keep your license. So he had to spend 10, 20, 30,000, whatever it costs to extend all those cages another 10 feet. So they, they don't mess around. Um, yeah, don't take that the wrong way. They, they are very, very tough, very, very stringent. And then on top of that, you got fish and wildlife. Uh, fish and wildlife will come out usually to inspect your facility when you get your license. And this is a state to state thing too. Every state's different. Uh, and they usually don't come back out unless they get a phone call. So usually somebody reports them and says, hey, uh, this person has something illegal. And I, I've reported places. There's a facility I went to that I was there, and I could already tell this is – being an animal person, you can walk into a zoo and be like, eh, I can already tell this place is not run correctly. And I went in, and they had some turtle eggs on there, and I was like, oh, where are they? So, oh, yeah, yeah, we're sending those over to China so they can eat them. They love to eat those turtle eggs over there. And they looked like a certain type of egg and of animal that shouldn't be sitting over there. So I was like, oh, okay. And I just kind of ignored it. I didn't want to act like an animal person. I didn't have anything on me. And I didn't criticize them at all. I didn't say anything. I was like, oh, let's see what else I can get through this facility. And they did this big tour through the facility. And I just caught one thing after another, after another, after another. I didn't get out of the parking lot for I call USDA Fish and Wildlife. And next year I went there and they were shut down. They weren't there anymore. Uh, I don't know if I had any part of that or whether somebody else came in and, and, and did that. So that's usually a proper protocol. If you, you see things that you know is wrong, that, that you feel is wrong, you should call. And I say feel because USDA gets calls all the time. Fish and Wildlife gets calls all the time about facilities that somebody thinks that, and like I said, animal people are the biggest critics. So an animal person might go to that facility and say, I don't like what I see there. So they'll call them just to give them a hard time. Uh. And that happens all the time. And the thing with USDA and Fish and Wildlife, if they get a call, they have to go and they have to check out that facility. So if you call and then, and they're all over the place, they might have to drive three, four hours to do this. Then a week later, somebody else calls and they got to come back and check out that facility again and again and again and again until they actually catch it with their own eyes or they see video or film. It's tough. Uh, one of my inspectors, they, they talked about how people would show pictures and videos from like five, 10 years prior to try to get these facilities in trouble, where they've already fixed the problem, but uh, somebody just wanted to get them in trouble because they didn't like them. So could the average person go to the USDA website and look up, know what to look for pr yeah. problems in their state? It's all up there. You can look up USDA regulations. So you can even type in, let's say you're sitting there in front of an enclosure. You're like, this doesn't look big enough. You can say USDA regulations for a tiger cage. And it will pop up. This requirement for this tiger cage is XXXXX. Mm. And it will tell you all the, the requirements for it. I mean, for rabbits. Rabbits are like five by five by five or something like that. Really? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, everything. Now, all, all mammals. So they, now USDA mainly regulates mammals. Uh, is what they're they're about and then um they're they're trying to do birds it's just complicated they're working on it but right now their main thing is mammals what about breeding and regulations around that same thing uh, in order to breed you have to be usda regulated you have to keep track of it. whenever you uh breed breed an animal you have to record it whenever you sell it they have to fill out a form and you have to uh the person who buys the animal has to fill out that form and the person who's selling the animal has to have a copy of that form. When USDA comes, they go through all that paperwork and look at all the forms of what was sold and what was bought and where they went. Hmm. Now it depends on the animal on whether or not that individual has to have any other license. So it just depends. And that's, uh, that, that goes state to state to state. Like I said, Florida is really good. There's a lot of exotic animals. You need either a class one license or a class two license or a class three license. Did they have three different tiers? in Florida of fish and wildlife licenses. Class one is like your, your exotics that are not really dangerous. Uh, like a tegu, the big lizard. Um, tegu is uh, different, uh, different species. It, it's all over the place uh, with that. Then when you jump to class two, there's a little bit more dangerous animals, things like bobcats and servals and uh, alligators and uh, uh, they put the big snakes on there. I think they're still on there, but there's a whole bunch there. And then the class three are like your tigers and your bears. You're like ultra dangerous animals. So with all these regulations, how did someone like Joe pass inspection? So 
it, looking at it, watching his inspection video, uh, he had a facility that was okay for the stuff. But like I said, this goes back to like USDA comes and, and they have to, they judge on what they see. And if they don't see anything wrong at that time, they can't do anything. So anything that happens in between their inspections, uh, unless they can prove it, they can't do anything about it. They have to see it. Uh, and so if they show up and they're only doing this like limited pet uh, cup petting and they're doing all this enrichment and they're doing all this cleaning and all these procedures correctly, according to these guidelines, and they have all their paperwork in order, USDA can't do anything unless they come there and the paperwork's not in order. Or this, or they catch something in the act, like something's wrong. And so that's where they would uh, not pass their inspection. There's tons of people that don't. I, there's so many small facilities like that who a lot of the times what will happen is you get written up. Like I said about the cutting board thing with me. Right. So I got to write up. And what that means is if they come back in the next inspection and that cutting board hasn't been changed out or I have another cutting board that has the same issue, it's another mark. It's two marks and then three, you can lose your license over a cutting board um, because you didn't fix your problem. That's usually what USDA does is they try to work with you to, uh, to make the facility better. So just like she said in that video where they had to make the cages bigger, he made the cages bigger. So whatever they asked him to do, he did. Yeah. There's probably a lot more than that that I didn't see because it was a seven-hour span that he combined into 30 minutes. Um, yeah. And so there's so much that you're not there for that you don't see and don't hear. Yeah, and that's the tricky part for like the average person. And that was a lot of the listener questions I got was like, well, how do we know? Because Rick Kirkham, he was the guy that was filming the reality show for the tiger yeah. and all that kind of stuff. I watched a recent interview with him and David Spade and he said, um, yeah. <laughs> but he lived there with them during a yeah. this, and there was some lady that couldn't take care of her horse. Right. Cause so it's an, yeah, I saw, oh, yeah, I saw this one. Yeah. For the, the horse thing, but she, yeah, we'll take care of it. And then he shot it and then fed it to the tigers. Is that correct? Yeah. And like, hugged her, like they have it all on camera, like hugged her, you know, cried with or whatever. It was all dramatic. And then as soon as she drove away, shot the horse in the head and it's like all on film. And that's, you know, part of the, actually well, somebody asked a question. It was Gail Scott. She said, was the hitman set up by Jeff to get the zoo? Well, th uh, that wasn't really related to a lot of people think that a lot of people think that was a setup thing, but who knows? I can't comment on that. I don't know. <laughs> who knows? I know for a minute, that question was related to the fire that burned all of uh, Rick Kirkham's film of that, yeah. of like the bad stuff. But just this fan theory, fan theories that he did it. Yeah, just uh, I say fan theory. I'm not a fan. Hold on, I'm not a fan of the show. That I miss. We're not a fan of him. Yeah, uh, but uh, yeah, the uh, the burning. And you, it's all speculation. It's just fun. It's fun. That's what's so fun about the show and how they made it yeah. is that you want to speculate and guess on that stuff. And it would totally make sense. There's so much video of him um, doing bad things, doing things incorrectly, doing things that could get him in trouble, like shooting a tiger. Like you can't do that. You can't just, well, I don't know what the regulations were at that time that he did it, but I'm pretty positive you could do it. <laughs> Most of the time they require a, a vet to come in and they have to hum humanely unite youth euthanize the animal um there's a way that they go about it there's a way usda regulates that also um and you have to show that stuff but uh so yeah they, that i would it would make sense that he would do that for the simple fact of hey i don't want to get in trouble <laughs> right so f i mean a lot i think a lot of people want to know like okay what's the conclusion what do i do what do i support what do i not support and i think if i'm hearing you right basically go to the USDA website and know what to look for. Just kind of have it in the back of your mind um, and look for zoos that are AZA accredited and support them and inspire yourself and your family to um, for animal conservation through visiting those zoos. And from past conversations with you, I think it would be safe to add don't purchase exotic animals or no? What do you think? Yeah, I'm never a big fan of people purchasing exotic animals. There's so much 
work that goes into them. They are a child. It depends on the animal, but most are a child. It, it's your responsibility. You got to look at the, the amount of time you got to take care of that animal and how much you got to feed that animal. Is that animal going to bite you? Is it going to endanger anybody else? There's so much that you need to know that I don't recommend it. Now, are there great pet owners? Amazing pet owners. I met some great people out there. Now, going back to the zoo thing, just because the zoo's not AZA regulated, don't completely discredit them. I've been to great small zoos right. that are not AZA accredited. You treat a zoo like you treat a restaurant. Sometimes you go to a restaurant and it's fantastic, and sometimes you go and it's not. Every zoo is a little bit different. And just because they're not AZA regulated doesn't mean they're bad. It just, because like I said, it's hard. It's very expensive to be ACA regulated. And there's a lot of things you have to do to get that accreditation. It just puts you at the top uh, of, the, of, the, of the list. But that doesn't mean they're a bad zoo. Like there's great sanctuaries I've been to. There's great small zoos I've been to. So don't, don't let, still support those places. Go there, get your own perspective of that facility. If you go there, you don't like it, don't support it. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you go there and you do like it, support them in some way. Support any small zoo or any animal person that's putting out good education out there you, and you can tell I mean this shows a great way of opening your eyes up and seeing hey I, I need to judge this a little bit more whenever I go to a zoo I need to look at that a little bit better before I just jump right in because it's so easy us as humans or as mammals see other mammals and we just gravitate into it it's so hard for me I've been doing this for 17 years I can't tell you every single program that I have a cute mammal that that hand just comes out I need to touch it. I need to touch it. It's just like your situation if you have a kid or if you have a dog and you're out walking your dog. What happens? Oh, I'm going to come up and pet your dog. No. Show some space. Show some respect. These animals, it's just like I always, my favorite thing to say is treat animals like people. If I were to see you on the street and walk up to you and rub you on the face, would you like it? No. Treat animals the same way. Most of them don't like to be touched. Just leave them alone. Mm, yeah. That's a really good point that you made in uh, about Joe Exotic, Tiger King helping us to be more discerning. Who would have thought that this crazy show would help us be more discerning as, I mean, not everyone gets that out of that show, but I think a lot of us who love animals are asking ourselves, how can we be more discerning about all of this? So um, you were talking about touching animals and mammals and our obsession with you being drawn to mammals. Um, let's talk about COVID-19 and uh, mammals. I, th you said there was some sort of update about cats or big cats. There is. It's still, still not verified. So, of course, the tigers got sick of the Bronx Zoo. That has been confirmed that they did get COVID-19, and they believe they got it from the zookeeper. Uh, the zookeeper came in. They gave it to one tiger that either she gave it to all three tigers or they got it to each other. Currently, they still – CDC does not think – that COVID-19 can go from animals to people, but they have confirmed that they do believe that it can go from people to animals, but they're doing a lot of testing now. So keep an eye out. The best thing you can do is go to the CDC website and check in on it every now and then and see where they're at because it's information that's changing on a daily basis. I, I keep hearing different things. Uh, uh, last I heard is the potential that some cats have the potential of getting it. Um, so if you do get sick, the rest recommendation right now is that you try to stay away from your animals as much as possible if you can have somebody else take care of your animals if you do get sick uh, because there is the potential they, they just don't know they don't know what animals can get covid right now but they there are some cases there's a dog in one country there's a cat in another country and of course we have the tigers here yeah. so it's popping up and it's something that we're learning it's it, uh, as time goes on that yeah it's it's a lot like all the information we're getting right now yeah <laughs> Yeah, same thing with us. We don't have. Yeah, exactly. Well, if if you're okay, I'd love to share some um, listener questions. They're kind of they're they're wide variety. So yeah. buckle buckle up. Um, you already heard Stacy's question, and I think we answered this question. Brilana Troublefield asks, "What's being done in the U.S. state slash federal to stop these zoos, breeders, and quote unquote rescues from perpetuating use and abuse of big cats?" Uh, there is. Like I said, it's changed. If you go back five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it we're slowly progressing. It's always a slow progression of things. Like something typically has to happen to make a big change. The Ohio thing that happened where the guy let all his animals loose, that changed a lot of stuff in Ohio. 
Uh, somebody gets bit in a different state. All right, well, the regulations will change there. So unfortunately, it's a, it's a reactive thing than a proactive thing. A lot of times you need, need something to happen. Use that in order to push things into change. Uh, this show is going to change things. I guarantee you it's going to change regulations. People are going to see things differently. Their eyes are open to when they go to a zoo and say they're seeing that tiger and want to touch it. They're going to analyze it a little bit more. They're going to want to see something, and then they're going to report it, and that's going to either shut down that place or make that place have to step up I guarantee you right now, anybody doing any kind of animal petting are going to be stepping up their game. Mm -hmm. They're going to be changing things. They're going to be trying to ensure better health for their animals, cutting back on that touching so that the animal doesn't get overstimulated, maybe going to a uh, animal has a choice or not to be touched. Uh, there's lots of different things that are going to change because of this show. So don't worry. It is changing. If you want to change it, you try to, but there are people out there fighting every day. Um, there's people in legislature all the time. I mean, I'm constantly hearing, like, let's just talk about the Argentine black and white tegu. For three or four years, they've been trying to ban that animal in the state of Florida because it's an invasive species here. Um, <clears throat> people got it as a pet. They let it go. It survives as no issues with surviving here in Florida. And so there's one side that wants to completely ban it. And then <clears throat> there's the educator side that we don't want it to be banned. We just want it to be regulated. Yeah. Uh, as far as, hey, not everybody should have this animal. Uh, anybody that's going to be irresponsible and let it into the wild, we're fine with them not having those animals. But still, there's that education aspect of when I take this giant lizard and show somebody, they say, what is that, a tegu? I've never heard of that before. And they go read about it and they learn about it. And it inspires them to care about that animal that's from South America and not here, something you'll never see or know about. So it's just finding that balance between the two uh, of, of giving the animals the, uh, the proper, what am I looking for? the best life. You want to make sure that the animals are happy. They're not affecting us in any way, humans, um, and just find that balance between the two. Yeah. So it's two parts, regulation and individuals asking the right questions um, to hold themselves accountable. Like, do I want to participate in this and to hold uh, the industry accountable? So Next question is a little bit, it's, it's a left turn. This is from Leanne David. She says, did Carol kill her husband and feed him to the tigers? We would love to know your take. Oh my goodness. I have no idea. I have no idea. What did she do? I don't know. Here's something I did watch though. Uh, there's a show called Lie to Me. I highly recommend you watching it. It's all about, it's based off a true story. Have you watched it? Yeah, I love that show. It's about facial expressions, or fa micro expressions is what it's called. Micro I'm I was obsessed with that show too. Been watched that thing big time and then looked up the guy who actually did it. And of course, the micro expressions are 100%, so they, don't, they use it here and there. But anyways, there's a micro expression expert that did a YouTube video watching her micro expression. So I, I recommend you go search that video and watch his perspective on that because it was really good. Okay, you need to send me that. Uh, video for sure and I will um, so I send a, an email out on Saturdays as you know to kind of recap the episode that came out on Monday and I like to put the clickable links in there so send me that and then I'll put the link in there so if anybody's listening or watching and you're you don't get those emails um, all you do have to do is text real to 66866 and then you're in and you're gonna get them um, so I forgot to mention real quickly because we're running out of time the Florida Panhandle connection in this whole story is so weird. It has nothing to do with like animal conservations, but it is so worth mentioning. And I'm sure you're already aware of it. Um, but it gets weirder because you know Dylan, Joe's most recent husband, lives here in Pensacola, right? No, I didn't know that. He lives here. He lives here. I had no idea. Huh? It was news to me. Yeah, I'm like all on this uh, animal stuff. I've dropped off it. I've dropped off in the past week, but man, yeah, I didn't know that. He lives here. And then um, when Joe was arrested, he, as you know, because they mentioned it in the series, yeah, he was, he was arrested in Gulf Breeze at a hospital, in the, in the parking lot of a hospital. He was at Baptist Hospital. In yeah. Pensacola. Yeah. Yeah. And, oh, it was in Pensacola? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the Baptist Hospital in Pensacola. Oh, okay. Well, he was like going for some appointment, but the... One of my listeners' sons was on the U.S. Marshals team that actually arrested him. Oh, wow. Isn't that crazy? But wait, there is more. Um, listener Stephanie Allen, who has been an expat in Costa Rica for a while and gone back and forth, 
she thinks that she met Don Lewis, which was Carol, Carol Baskin's husband who's missing, in May of 1997 in Costa Rica. And she has a picture of him, but he didn't want to be photographed. And he told them to call him Ron. So instead of Don, Ron. And yeah. so um, he had, like, there's all these websites that say that he uh, has a house there. And she heard that he has a Costa Rican wife and an American girlfriend. Lots of polyamorous relationships in this story, um, but that he's hiding out in Costa Rica. He took the money that was buried in the backyard. And yeah. So that's kind of a fun, um, what do you say, fan theory? Yeah, I haven't, I haven't heard that yet before. It makes sense. It makes sense that people like the draw to that. Like I said, that shows a narrative. It pulls that narrative in, and people want that narrative to be true because it's fun and it's exciting. But at the end of the day, is it real? I mean, you don't know. Uh, you just you get excited about it, and could it be? Could it not be? It it makes a lot of sense. He'd be down there because you heard the one thing say about, uh, well, he said something about if he could pull this off, then it would be the, it'd be great. So, okay. you know. Yeah. Well, the the odd thing is that in in conclusion, to wrap this conversation up with a nice bow, is it has given us all something, a wonderful distraction right? Yes. Given us yeah. something else to talk about. The, the irony kind of is that um, we needed this because of COVID-19, but because of COVID-19, the zoo that was Joe Exotic's zoo and is now owned by that other guy yeah, shut down as of like March 30th or something. Oh, really? It shut down? I thought it was still open. Really? No. I didn't, I didn't catch that. Yeah, I wrote it down somewhere in my notes. I took so oh, yeah. No, I didn't catch it. I missed it. Uh, um, the Oklahoma governor mandated the zoo be closed on March 31st because it's not essential. So, oh, okay. even though like this could have brought them like business, it actually, like COVID-19. COVID-19 counteracted that. So this would have brought them a lot of business because a lot of people would have went there despite it because they thought it's cool and they're not. They don't think about the animals uh, and you never know. I don't know what that place looks like. I haven't been there. I don't know what it looks like today. I saw one video of him talking to David Spade where he was sitting in front of this enclosure that looked massive. Uh, it looked huge. They had trees in it. There was grass in there. Grass is a good sign because that means it, they pace a lot. And so if there's grass in there, that means it's big enough space that they're getting around. And we jumped over spatial requirements. I'm sorry, I know we're, this is getting long. <laughs> so space requirements like we talked about usda does require a certain amount of space something they mentioned is that uh carol i believe mentioned that these tigers in the wild have 400 acres that they they go over or something like that something some big number which is true in the wild tigers do cover a huge area there's a reason for that and the reason for that is that 80 percent of the time they're starving they're having to cover this area to look for food and so uh, a friend of mine put in a great perspective actually she reminded me of uh somebody else that said it but it's like if you went up to a, a giraffe in the wild and you said, hey, giraffe, instead of like having to travel all this way to get water and travel all this way to run around from this predator, and when you get sick, you're just going to have to deal with it and get over it, uh, we're going to put you in a smaller space, and we're going to give you great health care. We're going to feed you every single day. Uh, you don't have to worry about predators at all, and you're just going to be taken care of. So you're removing one aspect of space and replacing it with all these amenities in the, in the zoo. And so another point that another friend brought up to me was that they're not having to chase this food. Like with tigers, they only do that because they're looking for food. And that's why they're traveling all this way. When you eliminate that, they don't need that much space. Uh, and that's where if you go to a zoo and you see a tiger, or you see a uh, uh, elephant, for example, in this, in this exhibit that's pretty big, but not big enough that you're like, it's not in the wild. It's because they don't require as much anymore due to the fact that they're getting all their needs met. They're getting that food. They're getting that health care. They don't have to run from predators. They don't have to run from bad weather. I mean, when these when hurricanes come, storms come, start, oh, yeah, just going into my little house that gets cleaned every day. It, it, it's very good conditions I mean, most of the time. It's very good conditions. And so uh, that was a great perspective that he brought up that I didn't think about too much. Uh, in the wild, it's rough for animals. It's rough. You watch those wildlife shows. You see animals with missing limbs and tails, and you'll see tigers with scars across their face where they've just been in all these battles and fights, and, they, and they're thin because they can't find food and then water. 
So that's where that battle of do they be in the line? <laughs> Should we have them in captivity? Should we not have them? It's this different perspectives. Take it as you will. Yeah, those. I mean, I think you did a great job today of offering the perspectives um, and also just a little bit of entertaining chat about our own personal views from the show. So I have one last question before we wrap up. And then if you want to share any final thoughts and certainly share what you're doing with Animal Tales virtually, because that's incredibly creative. Last question. There is a Tiger King movie coming out. Uh, Kate McKinnon is playing Carol Baskin. I'm oh no! So freaking excited about that. <laughs> Funny. Um, who should play Joe Exotic in a movie? This is multiple choice. I made these up. Dax Shepard, Bobby Lee. That's kind of a wild card. David Spade or Theo Vaughn? Oh man! So I've watched a lot of David Spade. Obviously, I was like, "Your your Joe Dirt would be the." Per- perfect uh perfect uh joe exotic but when you bring up theo vaughn that dude is already a joe exotic type person uh he's just a very <laughs> he's, he's a comedian if you haven't watched theo vaughn you should definitely watch him he's a funny dude uh it's a tie between those two right there theo vaughn and uh david spade i think theo vaughn would be the, the better route though that's a great vote awesome and any other final thoughts um, and your um, creative COVID-19 compliant animal presentations. We'd love to hear about uh, Like I said, make sure to check out your zoos. Do more research. Check out more things. Go look at the regulations like we had talked about, learning about spatial requirements, what to do. Uh, we're going to move forward. Don't think that all zoos are this way. This is very small percentage of zoos that are, are this way. And I haven't been to their facilities. I don't want to comment on any of those facilities that I haven't been there. I haven't seen what it looks like today. So. I have no perspective on that. Um, what are we doing with Animal Tales? So obviously, we can't do programs because of COVID-19. Unfortunately, we can't do any groups over 10. We don't know when the group numbers are going to go up. Uh, so we have seen a complete flat line in our program. So what are we doing? We're doing Animal Tales live every Wednesday at noon. So you can tune in. And we're still involving people with interaction by the chat. So if you want to learn about those animals, you have questions, you can get involved during the program by typing in and sending me a message. Say hi to me. Ask me whatever question you want about the animals. Ask me about whatever animal question. I'll just go off and talk about that topic. Uh, also, we will be offering programs through Zoom for facilities that you will have a private number and password that you'll be able to get in. And I know there's a lot of concerns with the security of Zoom. So we're doing it to where there's no interaction with anybody other than with us. So when you log into the Zoom, there's no video, there's no audio, there's a chat box that you can message me and me only and nobody else. You don't have to worry about any of the concerns that you've heard about with our programs because we won't be offering any of that stuff that could potentially happen. happen. That's fantastic. So the, the application for the paid programs, it, it, well, the benefit of the paid programs is that it's for whoever is invited to that Zoom chat. So we could, you could do the, the private birthday party. Um, you could do, like it could be a morale booster for a neighborhood. Um, if there was um, somebody who was sick and maybe they're quarantined, it could be a huge bright spot in their day. Um, I could totally see it as a gift. People could give one another like, um, they could contact you and be like, hey, I want to give an animal presentation to um, my nephews in another state and, you know, and then work it out so that it's like a surprise. And guess what, kids? They open up the laptop and there you are. I just think it's such a genius way to not only keep your business going, but also to um, help parents out because they're overwhelmed and definitely the kids no longer find the parents entertaining. So and the birthday parties we will be doing, that's the only ones we'll have in a, a video. The birthday party kid, their video will be here for me to look at. So we'll be able to have an interaction through that. So they won't have to do the chat. They'll be able to verbally talk to me throughout the entire presentation. Their friends can jump into the chat and they can comment through the chat. Oh, I love that. That's so awesome. Well, thank you. This has been a great talk i love it i can't it super fun. yeah i can't wait to um see what people think so thank you again if you're listening uh to this or you're watching it on youtube and you liked it and you have a friend who's fellow tiger king obsessed send it to them <laughs> thanks again cheers
Bye. Bye.